This is a press conference. April 9th, 1959, Washington, D.C. One of these seven young men will be the first American into space. These are the astronauts. United States Project Mercury. A substantial part of the imagination, energy, and genius of the United States is being devoted to the scientific exploration of our universe. The launching pads and gantries of the Atlantic Missile Range mount many of our experiments into the very nature of creation. This launch carried an Earth satellite into orbit. Soon, before the Earth turns many hundred times, a man will climb into a capsule at the Atlantic Missile Range and be hurled headlong into space. space. Why must he attempt this new and forbidding environment? Space with its belts of radiation, meteorites, solar winds, unknown cosmic forces. To explore his world, man has always risked the unknown. Because it is unknown, and man's nature is to know. Project Mercury is a beginning for man in space. It will take him 100 miles from the Earth. Here we think there are no radiation belts, solar winds, or unknown cosmic forces, but man the scientist, the explorer, must see for himself. Each component of Project Mercury will be held up and measured in the unbending light of scientific truth. Will it work? Why? Does it work under load? Why not? The problem of selecting pilots to represent the United States in space was approached from the same uncompromising direction. From all of the active duty pilots in the Navy, Marines, and Air Force, the service records of 473 test pilots were selected for review. 110 met the basic qualifications. Each must be a graduate of a Navy or Air Force test pilot school, 1,500 hours of flight time, qualified in jet aircraft, an engineering background, younger than 40 at the time of selection, and 5 feet 11 or less. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration asked 69 Navy, Marine, and Air Force officers of the 110 who qualified to come to Washington for a briefing. They were interviewed, tested, and asked to volunteer for the Project Mercury mission. 
Six were discovered to be too tall. Sixteen declined. And 47 volunteered. Thirty-two were asked to continue through a series of capability tests which would indicate not the best man in the group, but the various degrees of qualification of each man. Thirty-two candidates reported to the Lovelace Clinic in Albuquerque, New Mexico for an exhaustive series of physical examinations. These tests were divided between those given under normal clinical procedures and a series used for the first time in Project Mercury. A series of dynamic tests designed to measure the candidates' abilities during physical stress. Laboratory studies were made in each physiological area. As military pilots, these men had passed yearly flight physicals. But here at the Lovelace Clinic, each measurable reaction of body chemistry, each physical function was measured, probed, diagnosed. What is the specific gravity of his body? What is his blood volume, water volume? What is his total body radiation count? We are listening to his heart. When the astronaut is orbiting in space, the measure of his heart's contraction and expansion will be telemetered to the Mercury tracking stations. After a week of examinations, the candidates were sent on to the Wright Air Development Center in Dayton for stress evaluation and psychological tests. This Project Mercury candidate is preparing for stress. The weight of eight gravities will thrust upon him as he rides the human centrifuge. reactions are studied. The results will indicate how he fared under multiple gravity forces. Did he show a tendency to pull back? No. Was his tolerance level low or was it high? Now, can we shake his equilibrium? How does this affect his pulse and blood pressure? And what about his mental balance, his imagination, his personality, motivation? How does he see the different problems of living? And how has life affected him as an individual? Test his memory, comprehension, perception, visualization. Ask him to describe himself in a hundred different ways with a battery of tests. Now take him up to 65,000 feet for one hour in a pressure chamber. Now have him do this for five minutes. Then ask him to take a walk. Walk until his heart beats 180 times a minute. Elevate the incline one degree every minute. These tests continued until all 32 men had been evaluated. Seven men emerged from this competitive purgatory as the Project Mercury astronauts. At McDonnell Aircraft, they saw a model of the space capsule they would ride into orbit. They sat in the cockpit for the first time. This is the beginning for each of them. 
Captain Donald K. Slayton, United States Air Force, age 35, from Sparta, Wisconsin. Lieutenant Commander Alan B. Shepard, United States Navy, age 35, from East Derry, New Hampshire. Lieutenant Commander Walter M. Shira, Jr., United States Navy, age 36, from Wardell, New Jersey. Captain Virgil I. Grissom, United States Air Force, age 33, from Mitchell, Indiana. Lieutenant Colonel John H. Glenn, United States Marine Corps, age 38, from New Concord, Ohio. Captain Leroy G. Cooper, Jr., United States Air Force, age 32, from Carbondale, Colorado. Lieutenant Malcolm Scott Carpenter, United States Navy, age 33, from Boulder, Colorado. These officers were detailed by their services to report to the NASA at Langley Field, Virginia. Here, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Space Task Group, under the direction of Robert Gilruth, had organized a training program for the astronauts. They were excellent students, and they had a realistic and tough-minded approach to Project Mercury. They had to know all the answers. Here, they discussed the flight tests. In the flight program, they would ride both the Redstone and the Atlas boosters. But a man would not ride either booster until the full test program was a success. The schedule included first instrumented capsules, then capsules with a monkey aboard, and then one of the seven would go into space. The schedule also provided for the problems of flying near the Earth. They must maintain their proficiency in high-performance military aircraft. Out of this training together, a strong esprit de corps developed. They all felt that this must be a team effort involving all of Project Mercury. Recognition would undoubtedly go to the man who makes the first flight. But the second, third, or fourth flights may produce far more scientific information than the first flight. Soon, all of the astronauts were busy qualifying themselves for space flight. They rode the human centrifuges of the Air Force and the Navy. Here, they trained to increase their resistance to the forces of nature that were pitted against them. But each new experience, each small physical or mental victory was backed up by hours of classroom work. The time had come to select the pressurized flight suit they would wear. All of the suits tested were air-conditioned, had an attachable helmet and would protect the pilot from heat and from the deafening 155 decibel noise of the blast off. The problem was to select a suit which had complete pressure integrity, which was resistant to temperature and was not too bulky, a suit which allowed comparative freedom of movement, yet a suit which was completely reliable. This modified U.S. Navy Mark IV suit worn by Shepard was selected for further testing. To get the feel of space flight controls, this trainer at NASA's Lewis Research Center in Cleveland demonstrates the possible motions of a capsule in space. <laughs> 